grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In order to become a pastor, I had to submit to years and years of training and classes, and those were supposed to hone my observational skills and judgment to root all those things in a solid biblical worldview so that I could share observations with all of you. And so I'm going to share something that I've noticed over these last couple of months. It's been really cold. <laughs> Anybody else has noticed that? Okay, you had, maybe I didn't need all those years of training. Yeah, it's been awfully cold. And that means if you've noticed this, then you probably have experienced something of what we've experienced in the Morris house, which has been more than a little bit of cabin fever. As those cold days drag on and on, those four walls start to get smaller and smaller to the point that you just have to get out and walk around a little bit. But it's been cold enough and continuing cold enough even through March. That's why I said at the beginning, hopefully it's finally warming up. But it's been continuing cold enough that if you want to go out for a walk, you wait for a sunny day and then you stay in the sunlight, right? That's the way it works. It's a cold world, but we've got to get out. We can't just stay in. When we go out then, we make sure to stay in the light. These are the same images, maybe he's not tying it directly to climate, uh, but these are the same images that Paul uses in our passage today from Ephesians chapter 5. He's been instructing the church at Ephesus about all that God has done, and he's made it plain. It's too much to keep inside four walls. You can't just be church inside this building. You're going to be who God made you to be everywhere you go and in everything you do. And because of that, then, because you've got to get out, and it's a cold world out there. Make sure that you walk in the light. And that's what he describes in just today's short passage, and that's what I'd like to look at. It's how Paul describes what it means to walk as children of light. He starts in verse 8. He says to them, For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the world. At one time, you were in darkness. Paul starts by telling the, the church at Ephesus, and I believe the church even now, to remember what you were. If you want to be children of light, if you want to walk as children of light, you've got to remember what you were. And Paul actually has used the first seven verses of Ephesians chapter 5. We didn't read those today. But Paul wrote in those exactly what it is that they were before Christ had called them into the light. He summarizes it with three different things that I want to look at, because these are three things that, that Paul summarized as being real issues in the church of Ephesus. The challenge of sexual immorality, the challenge of impurity, and the challenge of covetousness. Now those are all words that can sound a little bit old and musty, so let's dig into those a little bit and see if they have any relevance for us today in our own culture. Sexual immorality. At the time that Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus, the Roman Empire was in full swing. And so the biblical teaching that sexual behavior was to be between a man and a woman who were married only within the context of marriage was not something that the Roman Empire had placed a whole lot of value in. They had instead taught something much closer to the phrase, anything goes. Married, not married, whatever gender you want, whatever age you want, it's all up to you. Anything goes. In fact, it had gotten so far in the Roman Empire that the only way you could really get yourself looked down on as being strange or odd or backward was if you didn't accept absolutely everything that anybody wanted to do. That was the only way you would be labeled as being backward. But that doesn't sound very much like our culture today, does it? The idea that sexual behavior ought to be between anybody who wants to have it at any time. Doesn't matter if you're married, doesn't matter what gender, etc., etc. And the only people who really are backwards are the people who believe otherwise. Actually, that sounds an awful lot like our own culture, doesn't it? And there's a reason for that. Because this kind of thinking, this kind of temptation is just part of human nature. So that means even those of us who have been reborn in Christ, our own sinful nature, the world that we're in, the devil himself will continue to hammer away at us, tempting us through these means of sexual immorality. 
Sometimes the church gets accused of talking too much about sex and sexual morality, but I agree with the theologian who says that sex is Satan's favorite topic. He loves to keep bringing around that particular temptation, but it's not the only one that Paul uses to describe the darkness that we once were. He also then talks about impurity. Now, to me, impurity often does immediately start to go towards sexual ethics, but he's already covered that. Here he draws it out as being something different. He uses some examples. Filthiness, or foolish talk, or crude joking. If sexual immorality was about what we do with our bodies, then impurity seems to be, in Paul's mind, much more about what we do with our mouths. What do we speak of, and how do we speak of it? Whom do we speak of, and how do we speak of them? In this category of impurity would fall all kinds of slander and gossip. The Roman Empire was pretty well known for the way that they loved to talk about people behind their backs. They loved to set up celebrities and then tear them down by creating scandal stories and all sorts of things. But that doesn't sound a whole lot like our culture today, does it? Of course it does. Why is that? Because this temptation to impurity in what we talk about, in the way that we use our words, is part of our human nature, and this world that we inhabit, and Satan himself will continue to hammer away at us through this particular avenue. And then he talks about covetousness. Covetousness is not a word that we use very often, even in Scrabble. But what it means is wanting something that's not yours. And Paul says that covetousness is idolatry. You see, in that time, for the people of Ephesus, it was very common to want a larger income than you had, or a nicer house than you had, or a better family situation than your own, or you wanted better possessions, better clothes, better physical appearance. Those were all temptations back in that Roman Empire, to long for something that you didn't have, believing that if you just had that one thing, then your life would start to fall into place. It would be meaningful. It would be valuable. That's the way they felt 2,000 years ago. But that doesn't really describe us anymore, does it? The idea that we would spend our lives chasing after the bigger paycheck, or the accomplishment, or the family relationship, or the, um, the romantic relationship, or the appearance or the material goods that would finally make our lives meaningful and joyful and valuable. We don't do that, do we? Of course we do. Because it's part of our sinful nature. and It's part of the means that the world and Satan continue to use to try to attack us. So if we're going to be children of light, if we are children of light, if we want to walk as children of light, it starts by remembering what we were. Paul reminds us that such as these, the sexually immoral, the impure, those who are covetous, these will have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. So as children of light, if we wish to walk as children of light, we need to remember what we were. But it goes on from there. Paul continues. I haven't even gotten all the way through verse 8 yet. Paul then says, walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Paul has not only told them to remember what they were, but now he's telling them, be who you are. He doesn't say you were like darkness or you were in darkness, and he doesn't say that you are now in light. He says at one time you were darkness. Remember that. But now you are light in the world. Light, excuse me, light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. And he gives them essentially three steps along that walk. He says to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. It starts by reflecting on what the Lord has taught. It starts by reflecting on God's Word. That's why it's so valuable to be here now. That's why I continue to encourage you, if you haven't been able to start making it part of your Sunday morning, try coming to an old Bible study, too, or to Sunday school if, if you're younger, because that's our chance to discern what it is that's pleasing to the Lord. He's made us new, but how do we live that out if we don't understand what it is that He wants? And so He says, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. But as you discern that, as you look at these things that you used to be, the sexually immoral and impure and, and covetous, where, where you expect that everything else is going to make you satisfied instead of God, 
you begin to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Then the next step is take no part in those unfruitful works of darkness. Now God describes, or Paul describes here, what the fruit of the light is. It's everything that's good and right and true. Now, most of us, if we imagine the day that our lives come to an end, we would love to have someone give the testimony that we lived lives that were good and right and true. That we were committed to those things that are good and right and true. I don't suppose there's a single soul in the world who would write as an essay question, what is it that you hope to accomplish? I hope to live a life that is evil and wrong and false. No one does that. Even those people who do things that we consider to be evil or wrong or false do them because they think, wrongly, that they are good and right and true. And so it's important that we discern what is pleasing to the Lord, what is actually good and right and true, because our own sinful nature in this world and Satan himself will twist that around. No one ever does something believing with all their heart that it was the wrong thing to do. Every step that someone takes, every decision that they make, they believed at the time that it was the right thing to do. That's why we hear so often that phrase, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but hindsight shows us it's not always a good idea. So we discern what is pleasing to the Lord, but then once we know what's pleasing to the Lord, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. That's who you used to be. That's what used to define you. Why, having been re redefined, would you want to go back to that? In fact, as I describe those things, the sexual immorality and the impurity and the covetousness, did those sound particularly appealing? Of course not. When we see them in the light for what they really are, we realize how shallow, how hurtful, how false, they really are. So we discern instead what's pleasing to the Lord. We take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Instead, Paul says, expose them. As you reflect on what you once were, and as you try to be what you now are, you see what it is that's pleasing to God. You see what it is that is the unfruitful deeds. And then you try to expose them. You try to help others not to fall into those same traps. You try to help them see what it is that is good and right and true and to avoid those things that are bad and wrong and false. That's what it means to remember what you were and that's what it means to be what you are. And you've got to do both of those things if you now are light and you're going to walk as children of the light. But I could understand if I were to stop right now with the sermon, that this would actually be kind of a frustrating one to hear. I've told you all the things that I think are wrong with you, and I've told you all the things I think you need to do to fix them. And I have no question that if you went out absolutely fired up that you're going to go out there this week and fix all of those problems, you would come back next week or in a month, and if you're honest, admit it didn't work. Not quite the way I wanted it to anyway. Because those unfruitful deeds of darkness, I still fall into them sometimes. And all those fruitful deeds, the things that are good and right and true, I don't do them nearly as often as I would wish. There's a reason for that, because everything up to this point has been law. The law that God teaches us, which is good and right, but which we cannot perfectly fulfill. So then he ends with what is actually the hardest instruction in the whole passage, which then becomes our hope and our certainty. Paul gives the instruction... Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, sleeper doesn't mean somebody who does what I tend to do on a Sunday afternoon, doze off. It doesn't mean somebody who's just catnapping. The word back then in those times for someone who had already died was one who had fallen asleep, and to refer to someone as a sleeper was to refer to someone who was already dead. Now, what possible good, we've all seen those police procedural shows, CSI, NCIS, or whatever the alphabet soup is, right? What good would it do if they show up at the scene of the crime and they tell the victim, hey, come on, get up. Is that victim going to be able to do anything in response? I use the image in confirmation class. What if we gave them some medicine? They can't even swallow it. To give an instruction to one who is dead is a pretty severe waste of time, isn't it? And yet that's what Paul's instruction is. Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Like I said, it's the hardest instruction so far, and if we just ended with that at face value, we would believe this is absolute rock. Absolutely no way we could follow through on this instruction unless we look back to what Paul had already written 
in Ephesians chapter 2, when he says that even while we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive in Christ. There's nothing less able to contribute, nothing less able to accomplish something than the person who's already dead and gone. And that's what we were when Christ came to us. Or to use last week's image, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is our hope, that we are new in Christ. We have been made new. While we were dead in our transgressions, Christ came and made us alive in himself. That's what we believe happens in a, in a very real, both physical and spiritual sense, at baptism. It's what we believe was delivered to us at the cross. We were made new. So now Paul's instruction becomes, instead of a burden, helpful light. It's not darkness that we have to flee, but light that we can celebrate. Remember what you were. You were lost. You were in darkness. You were dead. But now remember what you are. You have been made alive in Christ by his obedience, his sacrifice, his death in your place, and his new life. Remember what you were, remember what you are, and now Paul is simply saying, be what you are. The good news of what Christ has done for us is far too great to stay within these four walls. Just like at the end of a long cold winter, you've got to get outside. You can't stay contained anymore. That's the reality. The goodness that God has given us cannot any longer be contained in those four walls. So as you go out into the community, into your neighborhood, into your families, into your jobs, into your schools, into all the things that you do, go out and walk as children of the light. Remember what you were. Remember what you are. And now be what you are by the power and grace of Jesus Christ. For it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in this truth, in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.